All right, so I'm Zena Rakowitz. I'm a program supervisor at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Welcome to our Learn at Home series. All participants will be muted upon entry, but we'll unmute everyone after the presentation and you can type questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, today we have Dr. Michael Bubu, who is a physician scientist with an expertise in sleep, aging, and dementia research. He's an assistant professor of psychiatry as well as an assistant professor of population health. He received his MD from the University of Benin in Nigeria. His PhD is in neuroepidemiology from the University of South Florida, and he has a postdoctoral fellowship here at NYU. He's an investigator at the NYU Center for Sleep and Brain Health, and he's um, and you've probably seen him at your study visits. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Boo Boo. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so just gonna briefly discuss um, brain fog after COVID-19 um, infection. All right, the learning objectives for today would include um, learning really about COVID-19 data, just give a snapshot of it. And then I'll just briefly discuss SARS-CoV-2 itself as a virus, and then um, talk about COVID-19 risk and um, dementia uh, or Alzheimer's disease, and then explain some of the mechanisms by which uh, SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID-19, can cause central nervous system or brain injury. And then I'll discuss long COVID syndrome and brain fog itself, and then just discuss neuroplasticity and ways in which we can improve it and how to generally lead a healthy life during COVID-19. So just to give a snapshot of the COVID-19 uh, update in terms of its data, here you're seeing, uh, and this is a weekly total, this is the most recent data, you're having um, for over 400,000 um, cases uh, per week. Uh, deaths now are approximately 4,000, so you're having 3,900 deaths. So the trend from November 2022, as you can see, to January now is, is increasing a bit. And then hospitalizations are about, you know, roughly 5,800 daily average. In terms of vaccination status, um, and this is data including those that have received uh, the updated booster. So the updated booster covers for the new strains of the Omicron variant. So um, and we'll look at people age five and older, you have just approximately 16% of individuals older than five in the United States that have been vaccinated up until, you know, the updated booster. Now, overall, you know, the U.S. has had over a, almost 102 million cases, over a million deaths, and um, current hospitalizations stand at about 3,800, uh, so 38,000, sorry. And then um, specifically in terms of the numbers, we have approximately 50 million individuals older than five uh, that have received the updated booster. To show you the weekly trends, and this is going back to 2020, uh, January 2020, and you can see where we had this spike in, in January 26, 2022. Now you can see uh, January 11, that of course there's been serious reduction, but again, we were still seeing um, high rates of transmissibility. And um, this gives COVID-19 community levels in terms of transmission rates in the U.S. by county. Uh, of course, this is the map of the United States, and you're looking at the COVID-19 community levels. Uh, the orange in the, is indicative of high levels of transmission, and the yellow is medium level, and low is the green. And so you see most where we are in New York in the northeastern area, 
of the United States is saying that it's a high transmissibility really going on right now. Um, in places like Wyoming and the rest of them, of course, there's low medium transmissibility in, in parts of Hawaii as well. But generally, you're seeing medium to high uh, transmissibility in the northeastern and southeastern United States. So in terms of variants, you guys would know now that there are multiple kinds of variants and you can see it's the, uh, the Delta variant was what we were talking about previously. Now we know the Omicron variant and we have tons of variant uh, from BA2, uh, 0.121 to BA1.1529 and up till what's you know more prominent now is the BQ 1.1 variant. And this um, pictogram really shows you in terms of you know uh, the types of variant in terms of their proportion. So right now in the United States, You've got about 34%, you know, the range being about 27 to 43% of the BQ 1.1 Omicron variant. Right? And you do have other kinds like the XBB 1.5 is about 28%. And then the BQ1 itself is about 21%. And the XBB variant is about 5%. Um, and then you also have the BA5 to 5.2. Six about you know approximately one percent circulating. So, but right now the the, the greatest proportion is with the BQ one point one variant. Okay, let's just talk about the the virus itself. This is just um, you know a big picture of what the virus you know looks like in terms of under the microscope. Uh, there are four different kinds of proteins that this virus has. The envelope protein, the membrane protein, the spike protein, it has a nucleocapsid protein, lipid protein, all of them subserving different functions. And I'm not really going to go in deep into that because this is just a cursory uh, explanation of, of, of what the virus is and looks like. So... It's about 90 nanometers across, you know, around a millionth the volume of the sort of cells that, you know, it infects in the human lung. And, you know, the nucleocapsid protein, this is this protein here, right, acts as a scaffold around which the virus wraps approximately 30,000 nucleotides of RNA. And so how does the infection occur. So this pictogram just basically shows you, you know, steps, you know, so you've got the SARS-CoV-2 virus here, and you have this spike protein on the virus. So the spike protein on the virus bind to an ACE2 cell. So that's an angiotensin converting enzyme 2 cell, you know, which is the surface protein. And then You've got this TMP um, RSS2 is an enzyme that helps the virus enter into the human cell. And then you see the virus in the human cell, then the virus releases its RNA. And some of the RNA is now translated. So there's a translation, protein translation occurs by the cell machinery. And then some of these proteins form, you know, a replication complex meaning they can multiply and reproduce themselves to make more RNA. And then you now have proteins and RNA. They are assembled into a new virus in the Golgi apparatus, and then they're released uh, into the system. Okay, so this is just basically how it occur, uh, the infection occurs. So it needs the ACE2 as well as the TMP RSS2. All right. Generally, again, we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. Uh, these class of virus, they have bigger genomes. So they can be like, you know, when an individual is ripped. So they are like ripped genes. So genome of SARS-like coronaviruses. Uh, now, non-structural genes for non-structural pro proteins, you know, you have like in terms of size, 20 kilobases, 
uh, and then genes for structural and accessory proteins, about 10 kilobases. The key thing here, you know, you've seen the replicates in terms of the uh, polyprotein 1 and 2 in the spike envelope and nucleocapsid. This makes it very, very, uh, having a bigger kind of genome. All right. Now, those properties, you know, of the virus, especially coronaviruses, give them that elusive properties that allows them to replicate and then to mutate. So the mutation that the virus, in terms of trying to survive, is what is necessary, causing, you know, all these variants that we're seeing. Okay. So what does the data show for COVID-19 and Alzheimer's disease risk? So individuals with Alzheimer's disease, what the data shows is that they have three times increased risk of COVID-19. Also, when you look at residents of long-term care facilities, they are at much higher risk of COVID-19. And if you remember, you know, um, in the very early stages of COVID, you know, most of the deaths occurred in all in 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 these long term long term care facilities. We also see that in terms of COVID deaths, thirty four percent of reported COVID nineteen deaths in the USA were among walkers and residents of nursing homes, as well as other long term care facilities. And these are early data I'm showing you in terms of hospitalization. And specifically, you know, in 2020, I showed you the recent update now, but in the earliest stages, you're having the hospitalization rose to about 32% then, you know, um, and 30, in terms of individual Alzheimer's disease, so 32% of those hospitalized had Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And there's no indication that these numbers have actually changed. So we've had greater than 50,000 deaths even now from the pandemic, then it was about 20 uh, in 2020. Um, and this is related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is like what you say, if you have a baseline expected deaths, you have almost 50,000 more than that because of the pandemic that occurred as at 2020. So excess deaths, uh, expected from Alzheimer's disease patients. And then, you know, the mortality from COVID-19 is twice, two times higher in subjects with dementia when you compare them to normal controls with COVID-19. So an individual that has dementia with COVID-19 versus an individual just with COVID-19, the individual with dementia has two times higher mortality rate and then there's a ninefold increased prevalence of neurological symptomatology. You know, so subjects with dementia have a much higher prevalence of neurological complications. And the data shows up to ninefold. These are associated with increased mortality. So SARS CoV 2 cell entry, like I showed you in the other. Uh, slide requires co-expression of several proteins and these proteins interestingly are also found in the brain like the typical you know infection site would be the lungs but we also have you know a short talk showed you the ace2 and the tmp rss2 some of this um uh, transmembrane serum proteases and angiotensin converting enzymes. So some of them are also expressed as co-expression of this in the brain. So these are uh, possible pathways by which SARS-CoV-2 could actually cause neurological symptomatology. So you can see some of this expression of genes that, you know, facilitate cell entry in the brain, the, the, the transmembrane serum proteases, and all of these other ACE2 and all of them, you know, you have some have very l l expressed in a very tiny fashion. Some are expressed, especially the transmembrane proteins are expressed in higher uh, volumes in the brain. Okay, so what are the possible mechanisms by which uh, SARS-CoV-2 can mediate a neurological injury? 
So some of them are put here. So they could penetrate, you know, the olfactory, that's, you know, where you have individuals having loss of smell, right? So they could, there could be penetration via the olfactory, so it's tentacular cells, all right, to other cells and, and, and could also impact the olfactory nerve. And so it affects smelling, right? And the sense of smell and then could spread to the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe. These are areas that are particularly vulnerable in terms of are affected, you know, in terms of AD pathogenesis, the Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Also, you could have entry via the vagus nerve through, the, through its terminals in the respiratory tract. Okay, so that's another route. Oh, they, uh, the BBB is the blood brain barrier. So it has like an endothelial uh, barrier that prevents, you know, entrance or movement of setting stuff to, you know, go and affect the brain. Uh, but then there could be entry via the broad brain uh, barrier endothelial cells and parasites and compromise that uh, protection, really. That, that the other thing is, you know, through inflammatory cytokines. So you have cytokine release and you have an autoimmunity that's triggered by infection. Again, we said the, the, the entrance through the vagus nerve trace terminal in the gastrointestinal tract. So those are some of the ways that, you know, possible ways that you can have uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, CNS-mediated injury. CNS, we mean central nervous system. So if we look at the neuropathology um, in SARS-CoV-2 infection, it's interesting that it's been detected, you know, by PCR as polymerase chain reaction and immunochemistry or immunohistochemistry for spike and or nucleocapsid protein in the brain. So there's a possibility that when you look at the, the cortex, you're seeing things like basically signs of inflammation. There's an infact, hypoxic changes, microbleeds. In the frontal cortex, you're also seeing those kind of things, hypoxic changes. In the corpus callosum, you see hemorrhages or punctured hemorrhages. In the olfactory bulb, hypoxic changes. In the subcortical white matter, you're seeing also signs of inflammatory changes, basically, that range from hemor hemorrhage, hypoxic changes, in fact, reactive glyrosis in the brainstem, or causing a watershed impact and all of that. So there's a, a you know, range of uh, neuropatholo neuropathology that is seen really uh, in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we've heard about long COVID syndrome and then brain fog that we talk about. So what is long COVID syndrome? It is really the persistence of symptoms or symptomatology that includes a wide range of physical and mental psychological symptoms. And these symptoms are not necessarily attributable to any other cause. And these symptoms persist beyond two weeks for mild COVID disease, beyond four weeks for moderate to severe illness, and beyond six weeks for critically ill patients. Once you meet this criteria, then the individual has what we call long COVID syndrome. It's syndromic because you have, you know, a multiplicity of symptoms. So, and, and uh, pooled prevalence data show that the 10 most prevalent reported symptoms of long COVID syndrome were fatigue, you have respiratory problems in terms of shortness of breath, muscular pain or myalgia, you have joint pains, headache, cough, chest pain, altered smell, altered taste, and diarrhea. Now, there are other symptomatology, like we said, that includes things like cognitive impairment, memory loss, you know, anxiety, and sleep disorders. So all of the symptomatology, you know, from the syndrome, especially when they persist beyond two weeks, four weeks, or six weeks, depending on the severity of the COVID-19 infection. So you have long COVID syndrome. 
Now, beyond symptoms and complications, people with long COVID often also reported impaired quality of life, in, reported mental health issues, they reported employment issues as well, or inability to really cope at work. Now, in terms of management, you know, these individuals definitely require multidisciplinary care involving long-term monitoring of symptoms. So you basically look at the symptoms, identify the potential com uh, complications where necessary physical rehabilitation is provided, where necessary mental health counseling, social services support, you know. Um, and so the, the, the management of long COVID syndrome would depend really on you know, the symptomatology, and then it could definitely involve multidisciplinary care. So for brain fog, you know, this is a general terminology that is used to describe the feeling of being mentally slow, fuzzy, or spaced out, okay? It affects one's ability to think or concentrate. So that's the term, term when people use, oh, I have this brain fog, I had COVID, but since then I have this lingering brain fog. So what they're describing really is that they're mentally slow, they're fuzzy, you know, and, and the ability to think or concentrate is compromised. In fact, in a study of approximately 2,700 patients who had a confirmed COVID-19 diagnosis, in a phone call at least three months, after their discharge from hospital, you had approximately 1,700, that's about 62%, who reported long COVID syndrome. So they had persistence of some of those symptoms that we talked about after three months post-COVID. So now long COVID syndrome associated brain fog was also reported in about 7% of the patients. So People who would normally report brain fog, you know, would normally report them in association with long COVID syndrome sometimes. So about 7% of these individuals reported that. And then what were the risk factors that we found, you know, in terms of long COVID syndrome associated brain fog? So number one was female. So uh, female sex, you know, had about a 40% odds, increased odds relative to male, their male counterparts of having long COVID syndrome associated with brain fog. And those individuals whose COVID-19 presentation included respiratory problems at the onset, they had a 90% increased odds compared to those that did not have respiratory problems at the onset you know, of COVID, right? They're 90% more likely to have long uh, COVID uh, syndrome associated brain fog. And individuals also that had an ICU admission during their care had a 70% increase odds greater relative to those who did not, who their care did not involve ICU admission. So these guys were significantly more likely to have patients report, I mean, they, they were more likely to report chronic post-COVID brain fog by these patients. So again, female sex individuals that had initial symptomatology that included respiratory problems, individuals that their case was severe enough to necessitate an ICU admission, and um, these were really the groups that were more likely to report long COVID syndrome associated brain fog. So the study really concluded that, you know, um, this the chronic post COVID brain fog has significant associations with sex, particularly the female sex and then respiratory symptoms at the onset and the severity of the disease that would necessitate an ICU admission. Okay, so generally, I'll just talk about now about the effects of COVID-19 on the nervous system. So in a study 
that was conducted you know within a large hospital network in chicago and this was really the early stages there were tons of neurologic manifestations that were present at COVID-19 onset in about 42% of the patients, so almost 45 or to half. And then at hospitalization, over half, 63% had neurological symptomatology. And at any time during the disease, you had at least eight out of 10 patients complaining of one symptom that has to do with the nervous system. So notably, more than 30% of the patients presented with impaired cognition at the COVID-19 onset. So we're seeing that pattern with respect to COVID-19 and its association you know, with increased risk of neurological presentation, even at COVID-19 onset. So what are these manifestations? So they range from nonspecific and moderate symptoms such as headaches, muscle pains, myalgia, loss of smell, anosmia, or loss of taste. They range from those simple, you know, nonspecified, you know, moderate symptomatology to severe symptoms, including diseases of the blood vessels in the brain. And brain infections range from meningitis, encephalitis, does this inflammation of the covering of the brain or of the brain itself. And then most of the acute severe neurological symptoms occur only in a minority of the patients with usual risk factors, right? And associated with poor outcomes, including death. However, most COVID patients exhibit only minor or mild neurological symptoms. So most of people would be mild or moderate okay now this is a study by dr Fon frontera here at nyu so this is really a study with the nyu adrc team and the, the, the data used included data from the adrc as well where really they looked at um sorry they looked at uh hospitalized patients right in nyu in the nyu system and looking at the proportion that had neurological events so you had i said and this is as a 2020 this paper has been published it was published during the early phases of the disease you had about 12,990 uh patients you know and total adult covid patients admitted uh between march 10 2020 through to um, May 20, 2020 was about 4,491. So if you, I'm not sure if you see this, but you're seeing 12,990 adult hospitalized between March 10 to May 20. And then you're seeing about 948 with new neurological findings. So they had no history of neurological uh, disease. So those were novel neurological findings. And then individuals with about 12,000 individuals with no new neurological findings. And then you had individuals here that were included for this study, really 606 SARS-CoV-2 positive patients with new neurological findings, setting exclusive exclusion criteria were applied. And then um, in both instances, and so you had 606 in here in this group and these cases and in the controls, there were 3,885 SARS-CoV-2 positive, no new neurological events. So the first thing was just look at the percentage of new neurological diagnosis among patients with the neurological events, that's 606 of them. And these are some of the presentations. Over half of them had toxic metabolic encephalopathy. About 12% of them had seizures. 10% had hypoxic or anoxic presentation. So showing ox oxygen de deprivation. You had ischemic stroke in about 10%. You had movement disorders, neuropathy in 6%, and hemorrhagic stroke in about 4%. So patients with new neurological events were generally older. So there were 75, 71 years versus those without for 63 years, and they had a 38% increased risk of death. So the other fundamental question that Dr. Frontera and her team also, uh, again, including 
um, the ADRC uh, physicians and re- uh, investigators asked was, if plasma biomarkers of neuronal injury, right, if they correlate with SARS-CoV-2 infection, still using that same population, they looked at um, using uh, emerging AD plasma markers using what you call the CIMOR, excuse me, technology. And so um, some of the biomarkers they were investigating including t- included total tau, amyloid beta 40, amyloid beta 42. You had um, other neuronal injury markers like NFL, glial, uh, glial fibrillary acid uh, protein, and other phosphor tau, tau, that's phosphorylated tau with its different isoforms, including 181, 217, and 231. And so this basically just shows you the result. And really the summary there is that you're seeing, if you look at NFL, this is the normal, and those with this is a MCI, AD, and then you compare that with COVID-19 uh, patients. And so if you look at this, of course, you can see a dose response like a stepwise from normal to MCI-AD in terms of the increased level of plasma NFL. NFL is a neuronal injury protein. And but when you look at COVID-19, of course, this is acute. You're seeing very high levels, far higher. So you see that also across even GF, uh, GFAP and UCHL1. Um, so plasma neurodegenerative biomarkers in hospitalized COVID-19 patients are even higher than was seen in Alzheimer's disease patients. So I'll just do a quick summary in terms of what we've just been talking about and add some other things, uh, insights. So we've been looking at COVID-19 and neurological symptoms, talked about brain fog and all the rest of them. But it's important to know that, you know, uh, other vi- pandemic viruses that were associated with pandemic uh, status have also be, been associated with neurological symptoms as well. Like when the mers cov uh, as well as the SARS-CoV-1, these are coronaviruses. They've been associated with neurological symptomatology as well. The difference here, though, is we see, as I've shown you, that the proportion of patients developing such neurological symptoms and the mounting collective numbers is a bit startling with respect to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Now, early uh, last year's study really showed that some 36% of COVID-19 patients, uh, uh, this is in Wuhan Hospital, if you know that's where the origin of the first index case was um, identified, that they were developing impaired consciousness, seizures, sensory impairments, and other neurologic symptoms. So broadly, you know, the neurologic symptoms could be classified into two. You have acute symptoms that often afflict hospitalized patients with severe illness, all right? These could include confused state, delirium, that, you know, usually will present as an, an encephalopathy or you have strokes, like we've showed, peripheral nerve damage as neuropathy, or inflammation, encephalitis, or meningitis. Now, the second group, which is the long-term, associated with long-term COVID syndrome, would usually follow milder infections in the range from headaches, fatigues, numbness, or tingling sensations, or cognitive difficulties. And they could also go into the other spectrum of seizures, I have a myocarditis, which is inflammation of the covering of the heart. All right. But the people in this second group are people who slowly improve. All right. It's a summary again of the statistics with COVID 19 and dementia. We've said that people with dementia are twice as likely to be infected with SARS CoV 2, four times likely to die for it, from it. The risk is even greater in minoritized populations, including African-Americans. The overall hospitalization risk for adults with COVID-19 is about a quarter, that's 25% for the general population, but almost 66% of patients who had dementia and COVID-19 were hospitalized. 
And that figure jumped to 70% for African Americans with COVID-19 and dementia. Furthermore, over 20% of the patients with dementia died when they contracted the virus in comparison to just over 5% of people without dementia. So you see the higher burden in people with dementia. So people with vascular dementia had the highest risk. Of course, they had three times, you know, greater risk followed by patients with pre-senile dementia and senile dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or post-traumatic dementia. Okay. So, you know, we talked about the brain fog and the long-term COVID syndrome. Are there really, really long-term effects of COVID in the brain? The answer would be studies are still ongoing. It's still a bit early. We're learning new things, and we're, uh, some of them I've talked about. But what the real long-term effects, you know, five years down the lane, 10 years down the lane will be on COVID, uh, on cognitive health in terms of COVID-19 survivors. It is possible the disease could feed a spike in dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases. We're seeing acute, you know, rise of uh, AD pathology markers in the plasma. Uh, the other studies looking, um, and I know uh, the ADRC is also uh, along with Dr. Frontera, Dr. Wisniewski, uh, have this long COVID uh, study in which they are investigating all of this uh, effects. And so we will get more information and understand what the long-term effects on the brain possibly is. Okay, so I haven't learned all that. You're having brain, people are having brain fog, people have issues. What can they really do, right? And this is also turning to having co good cognitive health or good brain health. So neuroplasticity is that concept, right, in which the brain is able to recover and compensate for normal memory changes. And the question is, in order or not, can neuroplasticity be improved? And the answer is yes. Now, studies have shown and have found that early dementia patients are able to learn, regain abilities, improve their cognitive functioning. Right, so one of the best ways to do that is one to engage in something new, learn something new, do mentally stimulating and challenging activities. They can help promote and encourage the brain to develop new cognitive strategies or new neuronal networks. Okay, so you want to do or learn something new. The other thing is to consolidate on what you know all right so when you're able to consolidate on what you know you're able to maintain the ability to learn your brain is able to employ new strategies and studies have shown that even in LEAD okay reading comprehension problem solving social interaction can also help maintain memory and executive function abilities all right and this is a study just showing you uh, that cognitive activities help, all right? On the y-axis, we have the cumulative hazard of AD, so your risk of coming down with Alzheimer's disease. And on the x-axis, we have study year. And those lines you're seeing, these are individuals who put as high, they, they, they engaged in high levels of cognitive activities and these individuals here, low levels. So you can see that this line is lower than this one, just telling you that these guys have a reduced risk of coming down with Alzheimer's disease. And this is another study that looked at playing games and the risk of Alzheimer's disease. The games included things like chess, checkers, bagaman or cards, um, on the y-axis here, you have the proportion of people surviving dementia disease are free of dementia. On the x-axis, you have years of follow-up. The blue line are those who seldom play or engage in all of these games. And then the lighter blue line are the individuals who often will engage in, in, in games, in, in board games. And if you look at this, this is higher, it just tells you that you had more individuals in this group that were more likely to be free of dementia or survive, you know, uh, dementia 
uh, you know, relative to those that were so seldomly engaging in these activities. All right. So we we'll learn. We need to learn new things. We need to consolidate on what we know, and then we need to exercise. Exercise is so key. So exercise has a very strong relationship with cardiac health, as we know, with muscular health, as we know. But it is also known to protect the brain and the body effects from aging. All right. Studies have shown that individuals with dementia or cognitive impairment, right? If you compare people who exercise for about six to 12 months, they basically perform significantly better on cognitive tasks. These are the so, 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 so very important. One year of aerobic exercise also was found to be associated with larger hippocampal volumes, and better spatial memory. Okay, the hippocampus is that area that observes memory main, mainly in the brain. And usually in AD individuals, Alzheimer's disease, it is, it is, it, there's atrophy that it undergoes. So it's reduced in size uh, because of neuronal loss or neurodegeneration. So exercise is known to protect the brain from further impairment by preventing effects of cerebrovascular disease from taking place in the brain. And this is just a study, a result from a study that looked at exercise and dementia risk. And so here you're seeing this is Alzheimer's and this is any dementia on the side. You have cases and controls, and then you have the effects or the effect size with the odds ratios. So these are physical activity, this column. So you have non people who do not engage in physical activity. They are the reference group. That's why you have one here versus low engagement in physical activity versus moderate engagement in physical activity versus high engagement in physical activity. Now, the P for trend just tells you, you know, there, there's, there seemed to be a trend, meaning like a stepwise stuff telling you that that was significant. So if you look here, and this, because this is looking at the protective effect of exercise over, um, over dementia, anything that is less than one tells you that it's protective. So in the low individuals, you're seeing about 33% right? Reduce risk. 33% in the moderate, and then about 50% reduce risk. Now, the effect is very significant in the moderate and high, uh, high uh, groups. That's people who performed high, engaged in high or moderate physical activity. And the P4 trend tells you that that, you know, stepwise uh, results that we see between increasing from 33% reduction in risk to about 50% is highly significant. You see the same pattern as well in any other kind of dementia. Now, you might be saying, oh boy, uh, I'm compromised. I might not be able to do a lot of physical activity. Let's tell you how they defined physical activity. So high level of physical activity was performing three or more times right? Engaging in physical activity three or more times per week at an intensity that is just greater than walking. So this is not, we're not talking about, you know, um, lifting weights or doing something that is, that you think that you're not going to be able to do, just at that intensity that is greater than walking. Moderate level of physical activity was engaging in physical activity three or more times per week at an intensity that is equal to walking. So just walking. And all of the combinations were considered low level of physical activity. So what does this say? Just move, do something, be active. Okay. Diet is another key thing, you know, and this study is just showing a combination of diet and exercise. Your next X, uh, Y axis is looking at the probability of remaining Alzheimer's disease free. And then the X axis is just the time from baseline. You are having people who are high physical activity plus high diet score, low physical activity plus high diet score, and low physical activity plus low diet score. So you have three groups there. If you look here again, remember, it's the cumulative probability of remaining AD free. You can see this um, line. This is a high physical activity plus high diet score. They are higher. They have a higher probability of remaining Alzheimer's disease free. 
followed by the individuals who had low physical activity plus a high diet score. High diet score just means they ate, you know, properly, um, healthy, in a healthy manner. And then the very least individuals here had low physical activity and no a low diet score. You see again that dose response relationship. Okay, so in summary, you know, how do we try to stay healthy and nourish our brain? All of these things are vulnerable. Bad diet that can lead to obesity, social isolation, neuropsychiatric symptomatology like depression, anxiety, loneliness, poor sleep. They do not help with a healthy brain. But, you know, education, and when I say education, I'm talking about education beyond the four walls of a classroom. What you're doing right now is educating yourself. You know, um, we're talking about learning new things, playing cards that you never knew how to play before, learning a new language, traveling to a new place, all right? Engaging in cognitive activities like reading and exercise. Again, we're not saying you know, go exercise like an Olympian. The study that we showed you will just do something, walk, take a walk, be active. That's so important. And then social activities, engage in social activities in a dance class, in yoga, in, in a group, you know, uh, um, those, are, those are important so that you don't, you're not socially isolated. It's important to have a healthy diet have proper social networks, you know, and, and have meaningful life space interactions. Okay. All right. So staying healthy during the pandemic, you want to maintain a structured schedule, stay mentally engaged, participate in cognitive leisure activities, stay socially engaged, physically fit, eat a healthy and balanced diet, and ultimately, and importantly, sleep well. Okay. Thank you.